Well, thank you so much. Um, Joe, that was just an amazing talk. And, and thank you to Rong as well for, I mean, Rong's another person, I think, as you mentioned, was part of Biopath from the beginning. Um, and his background is so interdisciplinary. I think we see that in the way that you brought engineering together with the science. So I'm going to hand things over to Peter. He's going to be moderating the, the questions that have come up. Well, we, we've had a, a few questions come up. Uh, you know, I, I think... Um, you know, uh, maybe if, if I don't mind inviting the participants to, to read them uh, or, or, or uh, say them themselves, uh, that way, you know, if, if the context has changed, uh, you know, but they can, they can adjust wording, et cetera. So uh, maybe we can start off with our first question from uh, Jackie. I have oh, to Jackie. remember, okay. I'm sorry, I have to remember what I asked. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, oh, so I, you're, see, I, I can see it now. The, the tagging process to visualize molecules, uh -huh. when you were going into those details, you mentioned that in the appendix you might have a reference or you might be able to explain it a little bit more. Yes. My background is math and computer science, not biology, so I'm trying to follow this as best as I can, but I, I'd love to know a little bit more about those details. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, let's take a minute to go through that. So originally I had this slide in the, at that spot in the presentation. I was a little over time, so I moved it here. So um, the goal of this protocol is to make spatial profiles of two kinds of molecules, messenger RNA, which are the ones that turn sections of DNA into proteins using ribosomes, and then also proteins, which are what those mRNAs actually construct. So messenger RNA are special molecules biochemically because they have a long string of A's on the end. You know, they have their informative content, then at one end, they have A, 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 A. Mm -hmm. A is complementary to T. <clears throat> so there was a protocol that was called SiteSeq, which combined RNA and protein detection. And they use a priming technique. So priming basically means how do the chemicals, when they're randomly bumping into each other, actually stick together. So in this case, they said, well, we've got A, A. Why don't we print out a sequence that says T, 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 T? So they call that poly T or oligo DT. So when this sequence and this sequence randomly bump into each other via diffusion, they will likely stick. It's very energ energetically favorable for that string of A and T to latch together like Velcro. So knowing these two will stick together, then they said, hmm, we could write the row number out in bases. So this is some sequence that represents a number. And then there's also another piece, which similar to the way these two sequences are complementary, this ligation linker is complementary to uh, a, the relevant section of the second barcode. So we'll flow a liquid in that has this dissolved inside of a buffer. This poly T will attach to the poly tail of the, the RNA, messenger RNAs. It'll also attach to this poly tail on proteins of interest. So to, to make this happen, you have to do some magic beforehand where you incubate the tissue with some antibodies. The antibodies, the manufacturer has attached a barcode a unique sequence that represents which ant which antibody species it was. And then they also artificially put on this AAAA tail. So this, this, hook, this poly T hook will attach to both of these sequences here. So now we have a payload, like an RNA sequence, mm -hmm. AAA hybridized to TTTT. And then we have our road number and this Velcro guy here. So that's, that's all on the first stage. In the next stage, in the vertical flow, we have a sequence that's going to stick to the ligation linker here. And then we have the column number. And then we have um, a unique molecular identifier, which is a 10 base pair sequence. So basically, we want as many unique numbers here as possible. Later, when you do polymerase chain reaction to amplify, you'll make many copies of each molecule. So this tells you what the parent of each copy was. So the, there's only about 10 million combinations here. So I've had lots of interesting math discussions, you know, mm -hmm. four to the 10 is only around 10 million. So mm -hmm. actually it's not a unique molecular identifier. It's a, it's a sort of special <laughs> molecular identifier, but yeah. uh, that's a very common practice when doing PCR. And then uh, this is a way for PCR to know which end, one end of, the, of this combined sequence here. And then this molecule is called biotin. It, it, one of the strongest chemical reactions known in biology is the biotin streptavidin. So you take a, this is a way, basically a way to pull 
these sequences out of the solution. At the end, we dissolve the tissue and try to pull out these sequences using magnetic beads. Hmm. So in the end, you're building up this, it's just like a data packet in yeah. computer science. Right. And you read out this data packet by in the next generation sequencer. So I actually have um, a picture of this. So you get a text file at the end, it's gigabytes large. Our latest ones were 15 gigabytes. And you have two sequences, one from the left side here, which would give you a, a section of the RNA strand, and one from the right side, which would give you the row number, the column number, and the UMI. And you can actually see the, the strings that, that it prints out here. These are the, uh, the four bases in a pattern. And it actually has a quality score, which tells you how confident it was in each of those reads. And then by decrypting this data packet and software, you can reconstruct, okay, I have an RNA molecule that looks like it came from this gene and it was in Tixel 1.1. So I'm gonna you know, draw it here. And just do that for all 2,500 spots. That's cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Amazing explanation. Thanks. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> and uh, our, our next question comes from uh, Juan or Dr. No. <laughs> uh, just a simple question, Joe. Um, okay, uh, the, the resin itself, it looks like you developed something of a cross between uh, microarray and in situ hybridization. Uh, so I'm kind of curious about the resin that you're using. Um, so the polydimethyl siloxane, like the chemistry of it or, or how, it, how it behaves? Uh, how it behaves, especially the biomolecule. Um, so it is somewhat permeable. So what you're asking if, if things would diffuse through it? Uh, preservation of molecule um, and you know and uh, does it prevent any interaction with the hybridization itself so it's pretty uh, biologically inactive um, if you do make micro wells with it which is how single cell RNA seq kind of the single cell version of this protocol they actually live inside of micro wells in microfluidic chips and they can either be PDMS they can be glass so they don't usually have a big effect on the chemistry of attaching the probes. Hmm. As far as I know, <laughs> if they, if they yeah. do, we, we better learn that. But I, I don't think that they do. So it actually is very great comparison to say that it's a mix of in situ hybridization and micro wells, because that's exactly what it is. And uh, if you think about fish, as depositing, you know, really fish is a, it's, this is a form of fish, right? So the way that we're depositing liquid through these tunnels is actually a form of fish, except instead of using a fluorescent tag, we're using a DNA encoded tag. And the kind of the downfall of these methods Visium and SlideSeq, they're great methods. I shouldn't use the word downfall, but a difference in physics between us and them is that they're placing a piece of tissue down onto these printed capture sequences. And their capture sequences are very, very similar to these. They don't have a separate row and column number, but otherwise they're almost the same. And they're relying on the molecules of interest, say the RNA, to diffuse out of the tissue and onto their capture sequence. And that kind of limits which molecules they can go after. It means the molecules might move in X and Y, kind of in left and right and up and down while they're doing that. And they've done some amazing engineering to minimize the impact of that. But it also means they get fewer reads. They, they capture fewer molecules because not all of them diffuse out. Whereas in fish, it's so amazing because you're, you're saturating the tissue with a bunch of probes and they're flowing in, getting inside the cells and sitting there and reacting. And so our method is more like fish in that regard than these the solid phase capture arrays, how they call this. Does that get more of what you were thinking? Uh, yes, I understand a little bit better now. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Looks like uh, from the chat, we have one more question uh, listed uh, from Matt. 
So Matt, please. Sure. So yeah, so my question is kind of to, to take a big picture approach or slightly bigger picture approach anyway. Um, when you're talking about making the maps, are you looking for maps that are specific to that individual or is the hope to have sort of a, a generic map of the cells or sort of an atlas, if you will, of the cells of the embryonic mouse or whatever? That, that's a really, really wonderful question. And there's actually some controversy about using next generation sequencing techniques and RNA as a diagnostic or a patient specific tool. And price wise, it's getting to the point where, you know, it's similar to the cost of other expensive imaging modalities to do this for an individual. The question is, do you have a working model of a disease that's good enough to make predictions on the N equals one level? And right now, most people believe not, that we need to be making atlases of cell types involved in certain diseases. We need to understand more about how biology works and how proteins signal to one another and so on. So really, the, it is, there is no FDA-approved RNA uh, NGS-based therapy. I, I think the first one that might come close to this is the Moderna RNA vaccine for, for coronavirus. If that passes human trials, it would be a huge milestone in, in RNA biology and using it to actually fight disease instead of just learn more about disease. So DBIT, for example, has proceeded only on mouse tissue so far. And my, mice are very well researched. We have the mouse atlas anatomically, but also knowing which RNA go into which cell types in mice. All right, so this is just doing biological discovery. You can humanize mouse models and put human cells in there, but you're still very far from a human patient, right? One of our hopes is that this N equals large number type of study, not on an individual patient, will empower techniques that are used on individual patients. For example, H&E staining is the de facto method for pathologists to look at something they've a biopsy from a patient and say, is this skin cancer? Is this healthy tissue? Is this unhealthy tissue? What's the best treatment here? What type of breast cancer does this person have? If you have triple negative breast cancer, you want to know that as soon as you can, within day, a day if you can, because it affects treatment decisions. So if we can empower these tools that are used at the bedside with NGS techniques that take a week or two weeks to come back and are used at the research level, not, not at the individual patient level, so we can train somebody, a pathologist or a computer looking at h &E stain, which can be done that day, and say, when you see this pattern, you know it's triple negative breast cancer, that would be a step forward. I think that's the most likely way for this to, to touch you know, individual patient care. Now, if looking at, at this graph, you know, if this actually continues and you can do things in an hour for $100 and actually make a map that way, then I think it would be more relevant to think of this as a bedside thing. But um, if you read the news about Illumina, it's getting a lot of competition from other companies. Um, the acceleration you can see is kind of flattened off a little bit here. So will it get to that point? I think it's still a really, really good question. So if you, for example, um, doing an assay like this, if you wanted to do fish for many transcripts, say 100 transcripts, it might cost 10,000. If you want to do more than that, $100,000. There's other modalities you can use. Um, multiplexed ion beam imaging, which uses mass spectrometry, spectrometry and a giant magnet to shoot gold ions at tissue. These things can cost hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. So I don't think those things will make it to that point. But because NGS has this downward cost curve, it, it might. And you can combine it with those techniques to do discovery. But this is a, you've hit upon a really controversial <laughs> a question of where, where is this actually going clinically. Joe, this is some fascinating stuff. And uh, I think, y you know, um, I, I just want to thank you so much for sharing all this. Um, so first, I, I know we're on Zoom, but I'm, I'm going to give it up to you. So thank you. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> So, and uh, Juan uh, asked another, uh, uh, you know, question about, you know, talking about, you know, what, what, uh, how do we do this in our classrooms or can we do this in our classrooms? And for that, you know, we, we're going to have a great breakout group, but I mean, eight folks uh, here, I think, you know, that's kind of at that threshold. I, I say we stay all together. 
Um, but before we get into uh, our reflection or discussion, uh, why don't we take a five minute break, stretch, uh, refill your tea, coffee, et cetera. Okay, and then uh, we'll come back. So right now it's uh, 10.05. So why don't we come back at a 10, 10 and we'll uh, get it started about what the heck do we do in our classrooms? So, all right, everybody. <laughs> 